His mission is our mission. Let me emphasize it. His mission is our mission. Luke 4, 14 through 21. If you wish to, you can stand with me for the reading of God's good news. Luke 4, 14 through 21. The Word of God says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. News about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord God Almighty is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the prisoners and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. You can be seated. Do y'all like Mission Impossible? Has anybody seen those movies? Okay, date check, date check. Do you remember the original Mission Impossible TV show? 1966-1973. Do you remember it? I do. Saturday night, Saturday night, I would be allowed to watch Mission Impossible because there's nothing else good on TV at that time, so my mother would let me and my brother watch Mission Impossible. Remember that? Do you remember the, do you remember the catchphrase? Let me see if you do. Your mission, if you should choose to accept it, is. Remember that? Every show, every time. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is, and then the mission. Do you know that's what took place this day? If you would, God in eternity past said to God the Son, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to be born of a virgin, to go to the creation, you the, cre you the creator, to be born as one of your own creation, to walk among them, to love them, to share your life with them, to teach them, to make disciples of them, and then to die for them to give your life on a cruel cross called Calvary so that they may know freedom. But more than that, you know, our faith can be one of two ways. It can be a head faith or it can be a heart faith. Which is it? You see, let me, let me share. If I could use the idea of, of, of love, it'd be this. I know Webster's definition of love. And if that's all I know, it's meaningless. Or I can demonstrate in a relatable way my understanding of that definition to the wife whom I love, to the children that I have, and to you who I call my friends. If I have a head knowledge, and that's all I've got, it means nothing. But if I have a head knowledge that bleeds into my heart and captivates and, 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 and imprisons, if you would, my heart, and everything about my life, the words that I say, the attitudes that I have, is permeated in this aspect and this definition, if you would, of love. It touches everything that I say, everything that I do. Would it make an impact? Would it make a difference? I say that it does and it would. So it is with Jesus. You know, he's, he's coming out of the wilderness. Remember the story? Forty days. Y'all, I, I, I don't know about y'all. I'd go about four hours, right? You know? And then my stomach starts growling, and I, and I need me something bad. But 40 days, he was in the wilderness to be tested of the devil. You ever read that story? It's a remarkable story. And all that he went through, and, and, and Satan tempted him in, in all kinds of ways. All kinds of ways. And he wouldn't give in to it. We say, well, could he? I, I, don't, I don't know. That's a theological argument for another time. But he didn't. 
And it says in this Luke's writing that he came from that experience. And this is his initial move into his mission. And he goes to his hometown. You and I who are hometown boys understand, I think, in part how it must have been. Do you know I can be respected by almost everybody I've gone to and all the towns I've lived in? But when I go home, do you know who I am? I'm the runt of the liver, litter of the McCraney clan. I am Richard's brother, Sam Jr.'s boy, and Mr. Sam and Miss Emily's grandson. They don't know who I am. They just know who I am. And so it, it must have been some of that when Jesus went back, because we know in a minute they say that. Is this not Jacob's son? Is this not Mary's son? Well, we know this youngster, and he's only about 30 years old as he begins this movement into mission and ministry. But he goes home, and as he goes home to his home church, his home church, he walks in there and he takes the, the scroll of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 61. And he opens it up and he begins to read these three or four verses of Isaiah's word, written some 700 years before this. And as he does, he begins, at least in part, to tell his, his people, his family, his friends, what it is that he's about to do and why it is that he was sent, and what it is that God wants out of him, and quite frankly, out of us. He begins by sharing his identity. I know you can't see it here, but when it uses the, in the reading that he's the anointed, it has the idea, the root word is the Messiah. So he's already, he's already telling them, I am the Messiah. And I know we can't, we can't visualize it unless you've seen the movie, The Chosen, that, 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 um, um, Come on, Lynn. The TV show, The Chosen, it shows you at least in part how it must have been. He walked in there surrounded by his uh, peers. He received the book and he sat down on Moses' seat. When he sat down at Moses' seat, as the authority of the Word of God, it rankled some people bad because they look and they see him having the audacity to sit in the seat of honor and the seat of privilege, and the place where the rabbis seat, and the place where those who are learned teach and dispense truth as they understand it. And so as Jesus sits there, he says, this is why I've come. This is who I am. This is my mission. He identifies who he is. He shares with them, at least in part, his mission. God has sent me to proclaim good news to the poor wonder why. Have you noticed? If not, let me share. If I go to the prison, you know those folks want to hear me. If I go to the hospital, you know most times those people will receive me. If I go to the nursing home, most times those people will receive me. If I go to the graveside, if I go to the hospital, if I go to the prison, if I go to the poor, if I go to the needy, if I go to the disenfranchised, if I go to those that are the least and the last, the lonely, the forgotten, most times they receive me. But when I go to others, not always so. And Jesus understands that human nature is human nature and human beings are going to do what human beings do. And so he says that my mission is to go to the poor and share with them the good news. It's a relative term. I'm poor too, are you? I need me some mercy. I need me some grace. I need me some forgiveness. I need me some love. I need some understanding. I need some discernment. There's a lot of things that material money can't buy and material possessions can't give that God can. And so as he's been sent to proclaim freedom and liberty. He's been sent to proclaim mercy and love and forgiveness. He's been sent to proclaim good, good news. And all oh, the timing. Jesus is beginning his ministry in the first advent, which we just celebrated this not too many weeks ago. The second advent, when, when the first advent is when Jesus came. And when he came until he comes back, we are living in the times of his soon appearing, his soon coming again. And his, his mission is our mission. When we ask ourselves, what is it that God wants us to do? 
What does God want the church to do? What does God want His people to be or to do? Then I would suggest that maybe it is, maybe it could be that we do what He did and be about the business that He was about. As Jesus left that synagogue that day, you remember the, the story, two, three verses following this? He made them so mad they were going to kill Him. He made them so mad that they were going to throw Him off the pinnacle of the hill right outside of, Ga of Nazareth. They, had, they were determined in their heart because it's about religion at this moment. They see Him as a threat to their religious ideas and ideology. They see him as a threat. This is no longer Jacob's son. This is no longer a hometown boy. This guy is a threat to everything we are, everything we've been taught, everything we believe. And because he was a threat, they had to get rid of this threat. And by God's amazing grace, they didn't. In time, but not right now. And so as he left that town behind, as he began his mission and ministry, he began indeed to preach the good news to the poor. He began to set those that were slaves free. He began to share the news of the coming kingdom. And I would remind you, if we ask the question, what is it that God wants out of me? What is it that God wants out of us? I would say that His mission is our mission. In Matthew 25, we are invited by the Lord to peek into a time yet our future. When he gathers the goats and the sheep, and he says to them, to those of his sheep, he said that come and receive the kingdom prepared for you. And they asked the question, why? What have we done and what have I done that you might bless me, you might gift me, you might give me this kingdom, you might give me this exalted place in your kingdom? And this is his response. I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. And I was sick, and you ministered unto me. And I was in prison, and you came and visited me. And the response of those to whom he spoke was, When? When, O oh Lord, did I see you hungry and feed you? When, O oh Lord... Did I see you thirsty and give you something to drink? When did I clothe you and when did I visit you and when did I help you? When did I do this? And remember what he, he said in Matthew 25? He said, when you did it to the least of my children, when you did it to the least of those among you, when you did it to those that were last and lost and least, to the poor, to the disenfranchised, to the forgotten, to the unforgiven, when you did it to the lepers, and you did it to those out, when you did it to all those that everybody else had forgotten, when you did it to those, you did it to me. Can I, can I share? Can I brag? I love our church. Do you know how much we do in mission and ministry? Do you? We, get, we share the bucket every week, don't we? And when we pass that little <coughs> yellow or blue bucket, when you, we pass that and you give into that a dime or a dollar, whatever you choose to give, that, that that you give to that bucket, it underwrites and undergirds four ministries in our church. Cornerstone, Backpack Blessings, Christmas Boxes, and what else? I'm missing Youth and youth. And that investment that we make in these four missions, in these four ministries, everywhere it goes, wherever we use that money, ever how we use that money to help those that cannot help themselves, God looks upon that with favor, and God breathes upon that with His power and with His presence. And God says to we who are willing to, to, to surrender our stuff, and we give to His missions, around the world or locally or wherever we can. God sees that and God says, when you did it unto them, you've done it unto me. And I, for a church our size, I just want you to know how proud I am of you because His mission is our mission. Miss Jan, how many kids do we feed on an average? 50-something? We feed 50-something kids. Every weekend, for the, every week for the last several years, we've given up to 100 or more, and now some 50-something children, 
in the schools around us in our local area. We reach out and we share with them in our backpack blessings. We share that with them and this by more than one person has said, you don't know how much of a blessing it is. These kids come into our office looking for the backpack blessings. Looking and, and wondering, are they gonna, did they do it this week too? Do you know how powerful of a witness that is? Do you know how much that blesses and thrills the heart of God? You, you say, but I only gave a dollar or a dime or a nickel or a penny. So what? So what? When we give anything that we have, it's not ours anyhow. But when we give what we have to meet the needs of those who can't meet it for themselves, when we become Christ to them in whatever way that we can, God blesses that, y'all. And so His mission is our, min our mission. When we, when we gather up and we do our Christmas boxes in November, we have done as many as 600 and something boxes. When I first came here nine years ago, we, we did 200 and something. And God has blessed that because every box we send out, it goes to some family somewhere. And when they open that box up and they peek inside, those gifts that we have placed in there, it touches the heart of those that receive it. And Jesus looks at, it, at that and he reminds us, that is your mission. My mission is your mission. And if I could go, I'd do it. But I can't. I'm not here. And so I ask you, go for me. Go into the highways and byways. Go into those prisons and go into those homes and go into those places and shine the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ and share with them the message of hope and share with them the message of love and forgiveness and acceptance and whatever it may be. Oh, my. Oh, oh, my. There will be a day when you and I will stand accountable. There will be a day when, yes, I know salvation's free. Yes, I understand that it's because of us placing our personal faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, we, get our, we go to heaven. I got that. But because we go to heaven, shouldn't we do something while we're on earth? Because we've been given the grace of God and the mercy of God and the forgiveness down here, should we not live with eternity in view? Should we not do what we can to share what we have with others? Of course we should. Why? Jesus could have sought the spotlight. He did not. Why? He, should, he could have lived in a palatial estate and he could have been served because he is, indeed is the king of kings. He could have had a, a good life. He could have had a, 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 a life of... Of, of, of affluence or whatever. But he chose not to because he knew that that was not his mission. His mission was not to go, go to those who had everything. His mission was to go to those who had nothing. Nothing except their faith and nothing except a glimmer of hope. Nothing except what they had placed into the depository of God's goodness. As Jesus walked among the poor, he shared with us in his words, so there's 300 scriptures that remind us of the poor. I'd remind you again that in the Jewish economy, God had told them in no uncertain terms, it was expected and it was commanded that that Jewish people think about the poor. They couldn't gleam their fields when they harvested their crop because some of it had to be left for the poor. If they were bringing in their harvest and they dropped a sheath, of a bundle of wheat, they had to leave it on the ground so, because there would be poor coming later that needed it, whose life would be sustained by it. And so God reminded every one of them, every waking, breathing moment of their life, that because of my grace, I've given you a good harvest. Because of my grace, I've given you good crops. Because of my grace, I've kept famine away from you. I've kept insects away from you. I've kept the marauding armies away from you. I have protected you and I have provided for you. Because I've done all these things for you, the least you can do is remember those who are poor. Because his mission is our mission. There's generational poverty even today. When for whatever, whatever reason, grandmothers and daughters and grandchildren live in homes that are struck by poverty. And seemingly they can't get out from under it. I don't have that answer. But for those of that day that lived in poverty and had lived in poverty for generations... 
for no fault of their own, for generations, grandmothers and mothers and children. Jesus went to them, and Jesus spoke to them as an equal. He gave them dignity, and He gave them hope, and He gave them good news, and He gave them the possibility of rising above their search circumstances and situations and he pointed them to a better brighter day yes it may be difficult down here but God will give you the grace day by blessed day to eke out as nothing else a living so that one day one glorious day though you've had nothing down here one blessed glorious day you will have everything in my kingdom amen amen I won't have much down here I don't need much but I know one day, one glorious day, I'm going to be in heaven. Amen? And I'm going to walk in the light of the glory of God. Amen? And I'm going to see, I don't care if it's figurative or not. I'm going to walk on golden streets. I'm going to see gates of pearl. I'm going to live in a place where God himself abides. I don't know about y'all, but if I don't have anything down here, but I got me something like that, I'm good. I'm good. I may not have money down here, but I've got things money can't buy. i got peace. Do you? I've got a wife that tolerates me. Amen. I've got children that tolerates me. Amen. I've got y'all who I call my friends who tolerate me. Amen. I'm blessed. I've got a reasonably good mind, a reasonably good body. <coughs> Figuratively speaking, that is. <laughs> I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I've got peace of God, peace with God, peace with myself. I'm good. I've got, I've got loads of grace and mercy and good news that I've received that I can share with others. We are surrounded by people in need. And His mission is our mission. His ministry is our ministry. Let me end this by saying, you might ask the question, well, Brother Lynn, what can I do? If I want his mission to become my, my mission, if I want to engage in ministry as he engaged in the ministry, what can I do? May I suggest? Inventory your priorities. Get honest. What do you love? What do you love? Because whatever it is that you love, you'll do a good job. And God doesn't waste talent. And so whatever it is that you love to do, can't you maybe think of it in these terms? If God has given me a passion, something I love to do, how can I use that to build His kingdom? We had the Corvette Club over here on Thursday nights. Did you know that? The Corvette Club meets over here on Thursday night. A lot of those people will never darken the doors of our church, but they know I'm the pastor. And I talk to them. And Julie and Tom are members and president, and I think whatever it is, but a part of that. And we, 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 we allow them the privilege to come, and they appreciate that. But isn't that cool that we can use our church to let people come and share a time of fellowship? We have twirlers that come and use our facilities. We've got AA that comes and uses our facility. We've got uh, Girl Scouts that come and use our facilities. We've got prayer meetings. We've got women Bible studies. We've got all kinds of things that go on every week and throughout the months. Yoga classes and all that kind of stuff. And every bit of that is, a, is an investment into the future of our church and mission and, and ministry. And it all begins, everything we've done, everything we do started with somebody that had a passion and somebody that had a love and somebody that said, Brother Lynn, can we do that here? Yes, you can. And so whatever it is that you want to do and whatever it is that God has given you the ability to do, you can do that here. You can create a ministry here if you choose to. Maybe we could simplify our understanding of what mission and ministry is. It's not that hard. Mission is doing for others what Jesus would do for them. Amen? Ministry is equipping and enabling we who want to do something to be able to do it better. Is that okay? 
So whatever it is that we need to do, we can do. Whatever it is you want to do, we should do. But we just need to be about the business. Maybe it is that we could align our actions uh, to the resources that you have, more so that he has. We may not have a lot in money, but whatever we have, we can use to benefit others, can't we? We can benefit him, can't we? We can be a blessing to others, can't we? Then make a commitment. Is there something we're doing that you believe in? Is there? If there's something that we're doing you believe in, a mission or a ministry, what can you do to help it? Instead of give money. Please do. But can you volunteer your time? Can you share your talents? Can you do something to sustain the ministries of our church? Can you do something to sustain the mission of our church? Would you commit to prayer? Would you? Would you commit to attending? Would you, would you commit to, to being a part of these ministries? We say about our youth ministry, our children's ministry, our kids can't drive. If we're going to have a youth ministry, if we're going to have a kid's ministry, it's only going to happen if you bring them. If you who are mamas and daddies and you who are memes and pawpaws, the only way that Miss Jan can do what this church has asked her to do is if we bring kids to, to this church so she can. If we're going to have a choir, the only way we can have a choir is if you, want to, if you want to be part of it. The only way that we can do anything in mission, anything in ministry, anything in this church, anything outside of this church, it is somebody... Somebody wants to do it and somebody is willing to step up and somebody is willing to understand and see that his mission is our mission. His ministry is our ministry and say to him and say to, to us, Lord, use me. I don't know. Maybe there's something that God wants you to do this year. You want to do it? Maybe there's some talent, some passion, some gift do you want to share with this church this year? Are you willing to do it? Whatever it is that you want to do, whatever it is that you're willing to do, talk to the Lord about it. See where He leads and directs you. And let's see what happens this year. Amen and amen. As we have a closing hymn, a response to the invitation, what would you do? What would you do with that?